This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Right field. Right field. Right field. It is Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murph, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Glove Stories with Murph. We are really excited to have our uh, guest here today, who uh, is a long time Major League reliever in uh, in Major League Baseball, also a long time broadcaster for the Philadelphia Phillies, and uh, also a long time friend of mine. And I'm very, very happy to say that uh, we welcome in Larry Anderson to the program in LA. You know, first of all, when I start the intro and I say long time three times, what does that tell you about, about yourself? That I'm really old. <laughs> uh, you're just getting started uh, in, yeah. in this biz, right? Um, <laughs> hey, thanks for being here. And uh, I'm really excited to get a chance for folks at home to hear the stories that I've had uh, the chance to hear and been lucky enough to hear over the last uh, decade and uh, and change uh, sitting in the broadcast room and, and talking baseball with you. So, um, you know, we forget, I think, sometimes just, uh, you know, how good of a career and, and how long of a career that you had in big league baseball. You grew up in the Northwest and um, you were a pretty good athlete, right? I mean, baseball was not your only outlet early on, right? No, uh, I was... Uh... I think baseball I was better at, I think, um, which is kind of what led me to where I'm at now. Um, but football, I love football. I was a quarterback. Um, I actually signed a letter of intent to go to University of Oregon. And uh, in retrospect, uh, was told that had I gone there, I probably would have had a chance, a good chance to start at quarterback as a freshman. Um, but I also... When I graduated, I was 6'3", 180. And I'm pretty sure those 250, 270 pound linemen would have destroyed me. Had yeah. they got, and they probably would have got to me because I might have been kind of fast for guys in Washington, but I wasn't real fast for guys around the whole country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think you made the right decision there because I, I doubt you would have played 17 years in the, in the no. NFL had you uh, had you made it as a quarterback. But uh, when when did you decide? I mean, obviously you were drafted right out of high school, but when did you decide that uh, you were going to concentrate solely on baseball? Was it at the moment that that you got drafted? It was. Yeah, I think pretty much um, when I signed when I got drafted, um, I. I was a pretty good student, um, but I wasn't, wasn't my desire to go to college and, you know, do whatever. I, I, my first preference actually was to be a pilot because that's yeah. what my dad was when, when he was killed as a commercial pilot and I was 13, but I still, I, I love doing it. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of kids following their father's footsteps. I, I wanted to be a pilot, but I was born uh, deaf in my right ear. So I couldn't, uh, that eliminated being becoming a pilot. So I said, well, let's stick with baseball and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it turned out all right as we sit here and think back at it. But, uh, you know, you, you head off as a, as a very young man, um, probably wide eyed and trying to figure out, just uh, figure out your place in the world, let alone in minor league baseball. Um, what was the, those early days in, in the minor leagues like? Because now, you know, we know you as this, this, awesome personality that you know commands a room and 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 you know are is larger than life to be quite honest but 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 back then i can't imagine as a, an 18 19 year old kid were you were you the same at that point not really um i i was outgoing i was very friendly uh, i think always uh trying to care about other people i, I really did um but the the early going was tough um when I signed, I went right to Reno to the high A league, Cal league, uh, actually California league. And it was a strictly a hitters league. Uh, a lot of the teams, Southern California or in California, Reno, Arizona, and balls just jumped everywhere. So I went to Reno. I was there for a month. Um, and I wasn't pitching a whole lot. And they said, you know, we're, we're after a month there, they said, we're going to send you down to Sarasota to rookie ball so you can get some more pitching and get in games more regularly. So I was in my, uh, uh, what do you call them? The, the, 
the old pair of polyester pants, uh, my leather coat, my, my uh, uh, corduroy coat, the jumbo, jumbo corduroy coat. I was flying on a red eye from Reno to Sarasota. I'd never been out of Oregon or Washington until I got to Idaho. I mean, until I got to, to Reno, I, except one trip to Idaho. Well, you see, but outside of that, I never left the Northwest. So I didn't know what humidity was or anything like that. I take the red eye to Sarasota. I get off the plane, go through the airport, and I go outside to, to find a ride or whatever it was I was taking to, to the hotel. And I walked outside 6.15 in the morning, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> the, the way, like, it was, it was, you figure it's the 1st of August or right in there, end of July, first part of August in Sarasota. I, I had no idea what humidity was. No idea. And I was, this is not going to go well for me because I know there's a lot of running involved, pole to pole and all that. Um, and I'm like, this is not going to go good. So um, that, that's, that's kind of how it started. Um, I was in actually in Reno for that year or a month, my rookie year. And then the following year, 72 and 73, I also played there. I, I didn't move real quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, approximately nine and a half years in the minor leagues total, not all at once, but up and down, up and down, up and down. But the early years were, were some of the best years too. I, I, I don't know, probably a handful, five years ago, uh, my wife and I drove down to Sarasota. I wanted to try and find the area where I lived. We pulled into an information spot and uh, I walked in and there was some younger people there working. It was like a, a business bureau type place or something. So we pulled in and I'm thinking these young people, are, I wanted to find out about where this place was in 71. The only thing I remembered was the, the, the buttery was the restaurant was right by where we lived. So I went in, I'm asking, and, and I said, maybe this older lady could probably have an idea because she was maybe beyond my age. Right. So I said, ma'am, is there any, any way, do you happen to know where the buttery was back in the 70s, early 70s? And she goes, oh, the buttery. And she stands up and she takes me to the window and she said, you see that orange awning across the street? And I said, yeah. She goes, That's the, that was the buttery. Oh, how about that? Gotta be, and it's still a restaurant. So I looked down about a block, block and a half down the road towards the, the beach. And I see the same motel that five guys lived in across the street from the apartment that I lived in. They were still there. That's the only thing that Not was the five still guys. There. That was from 71 <laughs> until maybe 2015. Wow. Like, how can it still be there? All these, you know, condos and everything on Siesta Key. My, my apartment was still standing. I, I don't know how, but it was. Well, it's been deemed a historical site, obviously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or a waste area. One or the other, yes. <laughs> it needs to be cleaned up by Superfund or something. <laughs> well, as you progress through the minor leagues, you know, uh, you get up, you go a little bit more, the, the money gets a little bit better, the, the, the ball fields get a little bit better. Did you have an opportunity uh, early in the minor leagues? You got a signing bonus and you had a chance to, you know, you get you, simple pleasures or, you know, set yourself up for life, right? Yeah. I decided to go with the simple pleasures. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a smart man. As you mentioned, um, I, a friend of mine had a Mustang that was souped up. It was gorgeous. A 68 Mustang. And I just like, Oh man, that car is, I had the glass packs on it for the muffler and making all this sound and a loud noise. And I'm just like, Oh, this thing is, it's perfect. So he offered to sell it. And I was like, man, I can either buy the Mustang or I could, uh, I'm going to buy the Mustang. My other option at the time, um, I didn't really know much about Colorado or, you know, Aspen or Dale or anything like that. But I, I had a chance to buy 10 acres of land in Aspen at $700 an acre, $7,000, well below my my maximum budget of my signing bonus of ten thousand, but I opted for the simple pleasures. Right. And, well, and Aspen's it, never going to turn in anything anyway. So no, I don't. Th I don't think anything ever ever happened there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ten acres. Come yeah. On. Gonna have my <laughs> slope. Oh. 
but but that would have changed the whole the, the whole uh you know aspect of your life at that point so uh you know what you're better off with the must thing how, how long did that last before it broke down <laughs> uh well it didn't really break down it just it ended up in a ditch oh okay well it, in a snowstorm it happens it wasn't my fault <laughs> i'm mean, I driving but <laughs> it's never your fault larry it's never your it fault. Wasn't my fault. stick with that and we'll be fine <laughs> all right so you get through the minor leagues and I, and I know you you have so many wonderful stories about teammates and guys that you play with guys that you know most baseball fans have probably never even heard of but you know those are the formative years of your baseball career yeah. and and you come up and you learn the game and you start to understand the game the way that ball players do more than anybody you know anyone that hasn't played the game um and then and then you finally you get to the big leagues what what do you remember about that initial uh you know the initial call up and and the initial um major league debut and those early days when you were all of a sudden a big leaguer looking around saying well me after nine years and <laughs> all right <laughs> it was um i don't know it was uh intimidating back then when you're a rookie you came up you did not say a word you kept your mouth shut. Um, and if other players liked you, it was great. And if they didn't, they, it's going to be a tough go. <laughs> um, fortunately for me, I had the uh, ability, the, the God-given talent to be able to belch really long and really loud. Right. And that really, that set me up with, with a couple of teammates who had some time around, Fred Bean uh, and Fritz Peterson. Um, and so they kind of, I don't say took me under their wing, but they, they, they opened up to me and they let me kind of be friendly with them, but I was still, I still knew not, you can't get too friendly because they're veterans and you're a rookie, right. but it really, it really helped a lot, uh, that they, they kind of took me in and Pat Dobson became a very good friend, a great teammate, um, one of the funniest, if not the funniest person I've ever met. Wow. And that's kind of how things went. It started for me. It, it, it was just um, almost surreal. Uh, like you said, the money got better. The minimum salary then was $16,000, $16,500. So that was like, yeah. You could Talk have about all of Colorado at that point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could have bought the mountain. <laughs> But, That's awesome. Hey, side note real quick. I, I yeah. told uh, my sons, Matthew and Colin, last night that uh, I said, hey, guess who's coming on the podcast tomorrow? And they said, who? And I said, well, just think burp. And they're like, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've made an impact, Uncle Larry. You sure have. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All uh, right. So uh, you, you start to find your way in the big leagues and, and, and some of the, the stories that, that I've heard over the years from you that, that, that I've always remembered and I've recounted to others. Um, there was a time uh, you, you played with so many great, you played for so many great baseball men, first and foremost, and you played with so many great players over the course of your career. One of them is Nolan Ryan. And, 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 you know, he was one of the most intimidating figures in baseball at the time uh but he was your teammate in houston and uh well there was a time where the dude right lenny dykstra kind of uh kind of ticked him off can you tell us about that well it was a 98 86 playoffs um and it was the first game of of the series mike scott was pitching who won the cy young that year um so he's pitching the first game i think it was lenny's second time up he had a ground ball to billy Dorn at second base Billy Dorn kind of clanked it through to Glenn Davis at first. He dropped it. Dude's safe. He runs down, you know, crosses the first base bag, turns to the right, which is, you know, towards the first base dugout, which was the Houston Astros dugout. And I'm sitting on a bench next to Nolan and, and he, he's safe. And he dude turns towards our dugout, starts clapping and pumping his fist going, yeah, yeah. Like taunting us right out of the chute. I'm sitting next to Nolan on the bench in Houston. He just had one long bench. He didn't have a bullpen area. He just ran down from the, from the bench. Nolan's sitting next to me, he taps me on the thigh. And when Nolan taps you, you pay attention. It's like <laughs> EF Hutton. He looks at me and he goes, that boy just asked for a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when Nolan talked about giving somebody a bow tie, you know, throwing up and in, book it it was going to happen 
So Nolan's pitching the second game the next day. I know this was dude's second time up. You've seen the cartoon with Lucy holding the football for Charlie Brown, and then she pulls it at the last minute, and he does a bunch of flips in the air. Nolan threw a pitch that if if there wasn't anybody in the helmet, I think the ball would have gone through one ear hole and out the other of the helmet. I, I Video, uh, Dan Stevenson who has our video. He still has a copy of, of the pitch. And to watch it, I probably, it was probably – five years ago, maybe 10 years ago that I saw it again. And I, I still, to this day, don't know how dude got out of the way of it. His feet went up in the air. He did like a flip in the air and came down. He landed on his stomach facing the pitcher's mound. And when Nolan threw at somebody, he would, even if he did it on action, if he came close to hitting somebody on action, he would walk towards the plate and just look at the hitter yeah, and, and basically go, See what I can do. <laughs> See how how bad I could hurt you if I wanted to. You better be you better be nice. You better be respectful. And that was kind of how it was. It really. I remember Glenn Wilson hit a home run off of Nolan at the vet. Uh, had to be eighty five, maybe. I've never seen a player run around the bases so fast. <laughs> he crossed home plate. You know, guys were standing there trying to give him a high five. He runs by them, runs down his dugout steps. Guys are sitting there trying to high five him. He runs by all of them and runs down to the end of the bench and sits down and doesn't say a word because <laughs> he knows He's smart man. When, when you hit one against Nolan, he would watch you run the bases. Yeah. He would watch your aunt. If there were any antics, you were going to wear it your next at bat and you can book it. And no, Nolan didn't play those games. He did not. I'm so. not sure how Nolan would, would fare in today's game. <laughs> I mean, he'd fare just fine as a pitcher, but uh, I'm sure my, his head might explode. I don't think he would have had the strikeouts or the innings pitched because you've been tossed too many times before he yeah. got. To, <laughs> yeah. if, if somebody, if, you know, the other thing he didn't do, he didn't bunt on it. Right. Yep. At least as he got older, he, he would walk around the front of the plate, walk down the first base, third base line. This is right when he's getting ready to start the game. And he would do that and kind of look like in areas where guys would bunt. And then he would look at the opposing dugout basically saying, this is where you better not hit it. You better not bunt it in here. And, and I mean, guys knew it was just, it was a given. You don't mess with Nolan. That's incredible. Uh, you know, it was he, I mean, again, so many guys in your career that you got a chance to, to be around. Uh, certainly Nolan larger than life in, 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 in the baseball world. What, what other guys to, do you remember that, uh, that kind of uh, stood out like that, that just were, they were just guys you didn't mess with. Um. Well, one other story to Nolan, when uh, Art Howe was a manager, um, he was using me, I was a setup guy, and it, for whatever reason, when it was Nolan's game, I just, I don't know, I, I didn't think about it being Nolan, I just, it just, I think it was more coincidence that I coughed up his wins, I blow, blowing saves in the eight, eighth inning, and at one point in Houston, we were standing in the, in the clubhouse, and Art Howe comes up and is talking to Nolan. And I'm standing right there. And Nolan says, hey, Art, could I have a word with you? He's like, sure, uh, Noli, what's up? And he goes, is there any way you can keep Larry Anderson out of my games from now on? <laughs> Check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. That, that's going to do a little bit to hurt the confidence <laughs> level, right? <laughs> Well, I, I, I couldn't blame him because I'd coughed up a few of his wins. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I kind of, what I wanted to say was, yeah, is there any chance you can keep me <laughs> <open games?" laughs> I'll um, do any, uh, anything else you need me to do? Just don't yes. put me into his games anymore. That was it. Yeah. Uh, that, that. Perry was, uh, he was another guy you just, to me, you didn't mess with. He watched him, you know, I think it was spring training. We're playing the Cubs and uh, Spike Owens' brother, Dave Owens, who ended up being a coach in our organization for a while. He came up as a rookie, and this is a spring training game. And Gaylord throws him a pitch, and he says, uh, Dave Owens, take the big hack at it. And Gaylord walks halfway to the plate, and he said, don't be swinging like that off of me, Rook. <laughs> and wow. goes back to the mound. I was like, oh, hey. 
the, one of the best I ever saw was, and this is how the, Gaylor was a big man, big, big hands. We're in Seattle, in the kingdom. Um, and we're facing the angels. Reggie Jackson comes up the first time. Uh, Gaylor gets two strikes on him, loads up a little bit of grease on the ball, throws a spitter. Gale, uh, Reggie swings and misses, goes back to the dugout. And then the kingdom, the dugouts were on field level. There were no steps. It was everything was on one level. And, and Reggie's over there kind of chirping a little bit. Second time up, Gaylord gets two strikes on him, throws him a little more, a little bigger splitter, spitter, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, Reggie swings and misses, goes back to the dugout. Now he's jawing a little bit. He's hollering out at Gaylord. Gaylord's kind of noticing. Third time up, same exact thing. This time he really loads it up. The ball drops about three feet. Reggie swings through it. Goes back to the dugout. He's screaming at Gaylord, hollering at the umpires to check him, blah, blah, blah. Picks up the, the Gatorade cooler, throws it halfway to the first baseline. Gaylord's on the mound. He steps off the mound. He turns towards the first base dugout where the Angels dugout was and Reggie's doing all his hollering. He turns, he looks at Reggie and goes, <laughs> like zip it that was all you didn't hear another word off that bench or from reggie not a word and i'm kid i kid you not is even at that time gaylord didn't throw as hard but they knew he could throw it where he wanted to right and he, they could hurt him yeah yeah because it's like that we're just they they didn't take any prisoners it's like it's my way or the highway and I'm going to do it. And if you don't like it, you're going to get drilled or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's so different than what it is now, but, but those old timers, man, yeah, oh. they had a mean streak they, 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 and they wanted it that way. It was all business. When I, Nolan's best friend was Harry Spillman who played for the giants. When Harry, and when we would go out to San Francisco and Nolan would be running his lines in the outfield, pole to poles and Harry would be out there. Harry's wife worked for Nolan. He was his like personal secretary. I mean, that's how close their families right. were. Nolan would not even acknowledge Harry. Wouldn't say hi. Wouldn't not. I'm not kidding you. His yeah. best friend. He wouldn't even acknowledge him. He didn't want them to be friends on the field. He didn't want to have friends on the field. It because it made it tougher for him to drill somebody if he had to, or if right. he wanted. Yeah. It was a different game. Just business, baby. <laughs> business. Just business. Yeah. So, you know, you go on, you, you continue on through your career and uh, you arrive in Philadelphia. You're part of the, uh, the 83 team. There's some characters on that, on that 83 team. I mean, one that we're both very close to in Sarge, uh, you know, and, and, but uh, when did you start to become, um, you know, what, what we know today as the, the guy that was just fun to be around and, and always, you know, pulling pranks and, and, and being that kind of guy, how many years did it take in the big leagues before you could show that side of yourself? Um, I, I probably hurt myself by showing that side of myself before I was really established. Okay. Um, some, some players would look at it and go, this is the big leagues. We're not, we're not playing like this. We're not, and I was just having fun. I, I think right. part of it was just it. I would do goofy things just to help myself relax, to take my mind off the game. Right. To I don't know. I, I think I put a lot of pressure on myself, and it was a way of just releasing some of that pressure and just trying to trying to have fun. I, I, one thing I wanted to do, no matter what I did, was I want to enjoy the game, enjoy my time, enjoy you know however much time I had in the big leagues with the talent I was given. Yeah. And, um, it probably, I would say I started a little bit in Seattle when we had this Mr. Jello prank we pulled on our manager, um, Renee Latchman. And that probably is where things I kind of got a little notoriety as being a prankster. And, and after that, then it was whatever. Let's, let's just have fun and do what we're going to do. And it's so funny you say that. It's funny because as I was getting ready for this, I, I noticed on your baseball reference page that one of, I mean, everyone knows you as LA, but your other nickname is Mr. Jello, uh, according yeah. to baseball reference. Can you give us a little insight as to, to where that came from? Is it? Is it's it a long deep? story, but I'll connect it. <laughs> okay. uh, myself, Richie Zisk, and Joe Simpson. Um, we're in Chicago. 
we had a day off the following day. We flew in a, the night before. Um, Renee Latchman, when I was with Seattle Mariners, Renee Latchman was our manager. He liked it. He liked his adult beverage. So he went out to Rush Street. So Richie Zisk, Joe Simpson, and myself talked to Lee Pelicutis, who was our traveling secretary, actually got in on the deal. And he gave us the key to Latchman's suite. So we went down to the store. We bought uh, 16 boxes of cherry jello, put eight boxes of jello in each toilet in his suite. Went and got buckets of ice, poured those in the toilet. We tried to make jello in the toilets. Yeah. And then we basically just dismantled his room. <laughs> I mean, short of taking his headboard off of his, you know, sideboards and endboard. We we had his mattress in the shower, chairs in the bathroom, um, the lights out of the the sockets, the phone piece out of the 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 mouthpiece out of the phone. Um and it <laughs> <laughs> it, it was eventually called the, the, the Jello Gate. Oh um, man! This How long one until you were caught? We never got caught at the really? season-ending team uh, uh, party. We did a like a "What's My Line" type of deal with the three of us with Jello bag. We, we got three shopping bags. Joe Simpson colored them to make them look like Jello boxes, and the three of us wore them. And then players had to guess who it was. Oh, um, or, or Latchman actually had to guess. He had no idea it was us three. But this it went on for, for a, probably three to four months of the summer. And it was <laughs> it was something. I, I don't know how why I did it. I'm like, how can I do that? I'm I don't even it's my first or second year with the Mariners, and I'd maybe had a, two years in the big leagues. I wasn't established by any means. And why I let myself do this, I don't know. I'm Again, I'm not a smart man, <laughs> but it was one of the greatest pranks of all time to, to go through what happened throughout the season. It's pretty hysterical. Yeah, it's good stuff. See, and, and that's a story I've never heard. So that's good stuff. That Joe Simpson is nothing but trouble. We, we know oh, that. So. <laughs> <laughs> he is. That's great. So so you come to Philly first time in 83 uh, and, you know, you get it taste of uh, northeast baseball at that point you get a taste of the city of philadelphia which you would eventually make your home for for the better part of your life what what do you remember about that team that time uh, here in the city well i the phillies bought my contract uh, like three weeks into july i think like july 25th or something like that uh so it was like a deadline deal but they bought my contract uh from seattle in Seattle at that time, we had Paul Cerna at short, Dave Edler at third, Bruce Bakhti at first, Julio Cruz at second, Bud Bulling catching, you know, the household names that everybody's heard of. <laughs> yeah. um, so I left that club and went to the Phillies and I walked into a clubhouse and I'm 30 years old, so I'm not really a rookie, but I'm a National League rookie and I still didn't have that much time in the big leagues. But I walk into what I believe was seven future Hall of Famers yeah. and Pete Rose. So yep. Pete Rose, Mike Schmidt, Steve Carlton, Gary Maddox, uh, Joe Morgan, uh, Tony Perez. I'm like, what am yeah. I doing here? And I really did. I walked in. I'm like, I don't belong in this room. <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to be with Bud Bulling and Dave Edler. I, but I walked in and I, I see these guys Now, obviously they're not in the hall of fame yet, but I know their, their talent and you just to, to walk in and see Pete Rose, Mike Schmidt and, and Joe Morgan. It's like Steve Carlton. Are you kidding me? Um, it was, I guess, intimidating, really intimidating. And at 30 years old, I mean, I'm, I should be a veteran of five years at least by now. I'm not. So that I think that was that was probably the most intimidating I've ever felt in the big league. Just walking into that clubhouse. Well, thank God you had Sarge there to be like, well, if he can do it, I can do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be sure to tell him that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I remember that team. I was I was young, obviously. I was uh, twelve or thirteen years old at the time, but uh, remember that team uh, very well. And and I I was a Sarge. I love Sarge as a player. Yeah. And and you know it, that was a fun time in Philadelphia to be a baseball fan. But perhaps 
the most fun time to be a baseball fan in Philadelphia, at least in my early lifetime, was back in 93. Ten years later, you had left and and had come back. You'd bounced around a little bit. I think you got traded for a guy named Bagwell at some point in, in the middle of all that. We don't want to talk about that. But uh, but you get back in 93. And again, I would imagine you walk into that club as and, and you had similar thoughts like, what am I doing? No one belongs here. This is this is kind of crazy, right? <laughs> it's real crazy. I was like Krucky used to say about uh, Dale Murphy, who was Mormon, and you know, Mormons have to go on a mission. And they usually go to South America or Central America or something. Krucky's like, Yeah, they send the Mormons to South America, Central America. They sent Dale Murphy to our clubhouse. <laughs> South America, <laughs> South Philly. What what are the other? <laughs> <laughs> wow that you, um, it, it's true when you think about that uh yeah because you know cast the characters but but you at that point in your career you know you were a ringleader you, you kind of fit right in at that point well i was uh, the oldest guy around um in fact for Gosi, when i first got to spring training and i don't think i'd ever met him before um but so i'm up they skip larry Anderson, whatever yeah i know he says uh you know why we got you right I was like, no. And he goes, well, I didn't want to be the oldest guy in uniform. <laughs> uh, and I was Jim had that in him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That was uh, a bad team. Oh. Yeah. I know. And, you know, we've had a lot of the, the 93 guys on uh, over the last uh, couple months uh, just talking about that team. And obviously a special time in the city, a, a, a special yeah. time behind closed doors in that clubhouse, back in the trainer's room, all of the things that uh, that brought you guys together and made you the, the team that you were, um, you know, good and bad. Because yeah. <laughs> there, there's, there's probably large stretches of that season that some of you don't remember. But um, but at the end, you know, it, it couldn't have been any more perfect, it, you know, short of one Mitch Williams right. pitch, but it couldn't have been much more perfect. Um, I... I, I I'm guessing here, but I would imagine you wouldn't trade that time that year for anything in your career, right? That was the the greatest season of baseball I've ever been involved with. Um, it, it's what, as a kid, I thought what baseball was going to be like, you know, every year, which it wasn't. Right. But that year was magical. The camaraderie, the the just the closeness, of the chemistry, everything. It was just, it was like perfect it really was outside of as you said the last the last game but you know in in this city that almost is a is an afterthought at this point because no one sure everyone remembers not winning the world series but what everyone really remembers is just how much joy and fun you guys brought to this city over the course of that summer and and really i mean that's all you guys consistently come back and and are are beloved as being part of that 93 team because of because of the way you were and and win or lose it didn't much matter at that point i i think the the biggest thing for me and and people might laugh at this but it is it's honestly is the way that those guys played the game yeah. obviously off the field it's a different story it was it, played it was, hard and partied hard you know it, it exactly yeah. right and yeah. but but the way they played once they crossed that white line they they did everything right all the time. They hit cutoff men. They they moved runners over. Uh, it didn't matter where you were in the lineup. If, if a Crucky was hitting fourth or Hollins or Dalton, whoever, Mariana, it didn't matter. If there was a man on second, nobody out, they got the man over. They hit the ball to the right side. They did whatever they had to do. And it was to watch it, to, to watch this team off the field, outside the white lines, and and you go okay here comes the bad news bears because yeah. they've had no chance um after last night there's no chance right come out on the field cross the white lines it's business it's all business and it's we're gonna we're gonna come after you and we're gonna beat you and we're gonna beat you bad and that was that was their attitude it didn't matter how they did it they didn't there was there was a place for egos on that team but there weren't as a team, there weren't any egos. Their guys just went out and did their job to help the team win. And it was just, it's what I clamor for today. I, I don't see it, but I, and not, not exclusive to the fields to, to baseball. I just, right. it's yeah. a, it was a rare, rare season. 
Yeah, I would say sports in general. You don't see it quite like that anymore. Um, that's, that's just the way it is now. All right. Well, I, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do want to touch on uh, <clears throat> the second part of your career in Philadelphia because I think at the end of the day, almost as important as your playing career um, to your impact to this city is your broadcasting career. And it started uh, on television, and uh, you started sitting next to Harry Callis. You were, uh, you know, next man in after Whitey, Whitey passed, and that's a tough situation to find yourself in. Um, you know, you're, and you're sitting next to a legend who I know you were very close to in Harry. Uh, what was that relationship like, and what was the broadcast relationship like? Um, the relationship with Harry, <clears throat> excuse me, went back to uh, the first time I was with the Phillies and yeah. sitting on the plane with Harry, uh, sitting in the back of the plane. I would, me and him would would share a row, and it just when I came back in '93, it's I went back, sat with Harry. Um, wherever Harry was, I was, um, we'd, we'd have a social sparkler or two in the evening <laughs> times yes. and go to the piano bar and I'd listen to him sing. Everybody would. Right. Uh, it was just, it was a special relationship for me. Uh, I know when I first started broadcasting, I know video Dan Stevenson said, you look like a deer in headlights. What's wrong with you? And I, <laughs> well, I don't, I'm, listening to harry right yeah and, and you know having people saying well you have to interject you have to say something up i'm like do you understand that i'm i'm i know i'm working with him but i'm still what i still want to listen to him like it, it was funny it was weird it was like i just wanted to listen to him call the game because that's what i was used to um working with him was he just he told me he says i, I don't have a whole lot to tell you just be yourself and it's like Okay, but it, you know, you're working with a legend. It's, right. It was intimidating at first. Um, so afraid of messing up um, because that's, I don't want to mess up in front of Harry. Yeah. But he was, I mean, he was great. He was, you say what you have to say, you know, don't worry about me. I'll, I'll, I'll make it, a, I'll, I'll figure something out if you cut me off or you break in, whatever. So just be yourself and say what you have to say. So that you was know, fun. Yeah. And, and I was going to say, it's funny because it took you a couple of years, admitted self-admittedly, that, that to really feel comfortable in the booth. And uh, you and I have had this conversation about, uh, imagine if there was Twitter back then, the way there is you know, today, where folks can instantly give you feedback, if, if that's uh, the way we want to put it. But you were not immune to that. I mean, thinking about it now, um, you're, I think you're pretty immune to it. But, but back then... You took your lumps from the from the fans, did you not, Angelo? <laughs> Hello, yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to say destroyed, but I got hammered pretty good, um, and rightly so. I mean, I'm coming in, taking over for not taking over, but but doing the job that Whitey was doing, right? And he was the two of them were so beloved in this town that I like I, I felt odd. You know, I, I, I wanted to be perfect. I wasn't, uh, it was, it was tough. It was uh, at the get go. It really was. Yeah. And then, you know, TV, they decide the broadcast, uh, you know, the folks uh, running the broadcast decide, all right, we're going to move Larry over to radio and put him with this, uh, new punk that's coming to town, Scott Fransky and, uh, and, and see how this works. Um, I know your initial reaction to that was, Hey, I guess I wasn't good enough to, to swing it on TV, right? Yes, I, I was. It was no question to me. It was just flat out straight demotion. Um, I think I was at that point starting to become pretty honest, and I think that was <laughs> demotion. Um, no, 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 <laughs> no, no. Let's, let's not be honest over here. Um, I, I did. I, I do. I think that that had something to do with it. I might be way off base, but um, the, the the reason I was told was because they had a new guy coming in and they thought he would be most comfortable working with me because of my, I guess, personality. And they told Scott, they said they wanted him working with me to try and bring out my personality more. Um, and the, the we just, we hit it off. I mean, instantly we 
we just we became friends um even through the age discrepancy the 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 um i don't know what it was we just we we just hit it off and i think all of us in the broadcast booth hit it off together i mean i it just it became almost like a little our own little family yeah and uh, once once i got to radio and and let go of the demotion thing in my own head i i if they said hey come back to tv blah 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 but forget it i want no part of it i really don't i yeah. i would i couldn't have been more blessed with the way things worked out for me having a partner like scott and and working with him uh it's the best thing that happened to me as far as broadcasting yeah because <laughs> you guys have you've made it pretty special for uh uh, for the better part of a decade plus and, and, and what you guys have been able to do side note. Um, if you get removed from television and then you get put on the radio, that's, that's a, that's a great thing. All right. That's a, well, there's a special little club <laughs> and I, and I applaud you for, for the way you've handled it. Uh, there, there is nothing better quite frankly, but that, no, you know, listening to you and Scott over the years, um, you know, and, and you've, you've grown together to become, you know, a tandem that can be mentioned in the same breath as Harry and Whitey. And I know when people know you, you can, and, and when people say that you, you react like that, but, uh, but it's true. And, and it's, it's a huge impact in, in what we do, you know, I think, you know, Scott said early on, he said, <coughs> excuse me, he said, our, our job is to entertain that to keep the folks at home listening, no matter the score of the game, no matter what it is, we have to entertain the fans and we have to keep their attention and I, I felt you know after he said that I was like thinking about it it's like you know if it's a close game a tight game the game's going to take care of itself and if it's a blowout our our rapport you know me being the idiot and him being you know the the straight guy um it just it became our shtick I guess so I, I think still trying to entertain people when the game's not all that fun to watch at the time. Um, I think we both understood that, or I understood that better when he had talked about it and uh, it's made a difference. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, Larry, you know, there's that old saying that baseball has been very, very good to a lot of yeah. folks. Baseball has been very, very good to you. Yes. Um, and in turn, you have been very, very good uh, for the world of baseball in, in the city of Philadelphia, for sure. Um, you Maybe know, from, standpoint <laughs> yeah. but uh you know I, I i you know you always think back and think hey if anything had changed if something had been different maybe you know everything else would be different um i would imagine you feel pretty comfortable at this point with the way your baseball life has has kind of uh you know taking you to where you are right now right yeah i i looking back in retrospect i i don't think i'd change anything you know maybe Maybe uh, trying to be a little more, pre not prepared, a little, I don't know what the word is. I, I probably could have done a little more, but looking back, <laughs> I'm, I have no regrets. The baseball yeah. has been great to me. The Phillies have been great to me. Um, and that's how, how more blessed can you be? I hear you. And if you only bought that land in Aspen, everything would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> time <laughs> <laughs> larry uh thank you so much for uh, for doing this um i feel like we just invited everybody into the, the bus or the plane uh or the broadcasting office because this is what we do every day we just sit around yeah. and talk about uh baseball and, and the stories but uh yeah. it's nice to be able to share your stories with with the folks that are listening out there well i appreciate it murph it's a lot of fun i enjoyed it all right larry anderson uh, our guest today on glove stories with murph uh, we'll be right back. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. <laughs> 
Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Glove Stories with Murph. We welcome in the manager of the 2008 Philadelphia Phillies, Charlie Manuel, to help us relive one of those games from that magical season. And, Charlie, good to see you. We are going to relive the game from July 11th, 2008. Uh, it was a, a packed house at Citizens Bank Park, 45,000 plus there to watch you guys play in the middle of the summer. And I think that's kind of appropriate place to start because we're going to see bigger crowds and packed houses now in Philadelphia. Now that the, the restrictions have been lifted, how important were the fans for you guys as you went through the 2008 season? Yeah, Greg, uh, I've always said about our fans, you know, like uh, the fact that we, most of the time, we, you know, like we always had a full house and that definitely, uh, I, I, it creates a lot of energy in our ballpark. I was talking to someone the other day about how I like the setting in the Citizens Bank Bank Park and how the uh, the the ballpark is laid out. You know, like and it kind of comes back around and it's kind yep. of a kind of it's kind of fits in together and 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 actually you know like uh, there's a roar. I mean, there's a huge a roar. You know, like uh, when you're down on the field and it definitely brings a lot of energy. I've always given them a lot of credit if you remember and and. Uh, yeah, and this was one of those games. Yeah, I mean, no doubt about it. Yeah, and, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, in the middle of July, and again, we, we often say this on the podcast because you don't know that the season's going to end the way it does. You know, you're still in the process of trying to get to the postseason, and, uh, but the fans came out each and every day to watch your team play, and, uh, and it was. It was a big deal, and uh, you know, like you said, it kind of wraps around. It's like a big 45,000-person right. hug. Uh, down there at Citizens <laughs> Bank Park, and, and it does make a difference. All right, so the game was against the Diamondbacks, so a team from the NL West coming into Philadelphia. The pitching matchup was Kyle Kendrick versus Doug Davis, and both guys would pitch very well. The Phillies got the scoring start at first. Why not? Ryan Howard, second inning with a home run, number 28 on the season for Ryan, a good way to start uh, for him. You know, he was one of those guys that seemed to do that every other day to get you guys uh, started in the right direction. Yeah, whenever we uh, at the big moment at uh, that right there is why Howard hit fourth. That's why we nicknamed him Big Beast. You know, like that's right. <laughs> uh, you know, like it, he was always capable of hitting the ball out of the yard. And when he puts you on the board, usually that, that generates a lot of energy for us too. Or, or it re used to re really bring our team up. Yeah. And that day, that when he, when he hit the home run, of course that put us ahead, and the game stayed that way for a little, quite a while. It did. And that's because Kyle Kendrick was pitching really well for you guys. And, you know, he's one of those guys that we probably don't talk about enough when we're thinking back about the 2008 season. What do you remember about KK? And, you know, he's he's a terrific guy in the clubhouse. He's a great person to be around. But he was really good for you guys as well. Uh, you know something, uh, uh, Murph, I like to explain KK this way. We were in need of a, pit, a pitcher. We came home on a road road trip uh, from a road trip, and he pitched against the Chicago White Sox. That was his first start in the big leagues. Right. And uh, Dallas Green had seen him uh, pitching uh, 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 Redding. And actually, if you go look at his record and everything, you know, like it wasn't, you know, wasn't very good. And so he comes up and he starts a game and like emergency start for us. And uh, I want to say he goes through five innings, uh, five in, uh, at least five innings that day. Maybe he might have got us into the six. I don't quite remember. But anyway, you know, like uh, the next time come around and people were wondering if he's going to stay in a rotation. And uh, I remember I kept saying, well, we'll see, we'll see. And, and so the next, the next time he came around, of course, we used him. And uh, for some reason, it seemed like, uh, for about his first two two seasons in the major leagues or three seasons, whatever, it seems like that he was always there and he was always in our rotation and he always had the same thing, you know, wondering, you know, like who, uh, you know, like who, who, who who's going to miss their start or right. who's going to be taken out of the rotation. And he survived all of that. And the reason <laughs> he survived because he, he was injury free and he always could post and he always could get, get you to the part of the game. If you remember, if you look at baseball now and you understand how good KK actually was, yeah. because he could get us where we wanted to go in the game, like five through six innings, and even sometimes he'd get us in the seven. And he was a, he was very important to our team for yeah. quite a few years. 
he was a battler for sure. And to your point, you had such a good bullpen uh, during that season that you, if you got to five or six, you felt pretty comfortable that you hand the ball out to, to the rest of those guys and they were going to get the job done. So Kyle was there and he gave you a chance to win. That's really all you can ask for out of your starter. So the, yeah, it, it, and, and you look back and you think about it and, and Kyle was such a big part of that. All right, so the Diamondbacks would tie up the game 1-1 in the sixth inning, but your guys would answer right back in the bottom of the sixth uh, two outs. Pedro Feliz would walk. Shane Victorino doubled. And Doug Davis would uncork a wild pitch that scored Feliz. So thank you for that, Doug Davis. They would <laughs> then intentionally walk Carlos Ruiz. And, and this was an interesting play in this game because right. Carlos, who doesn't steal a whole lot of bases, decides to try and steal second. Right. He gets caught in a rundown. And Shane Victorino scores during that rundown before Ruiz gets tagged out. Is that a design right. play by you guys? Yes, that was the, he's supposed to get hung up. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, like he would get in a rundown and, you know, like in Victorino's, uh, you know, like he's he's going to get a, a lead off the walking lead off third base. And, you know, like, and, and how if they throw down, you know, like he's coming home. And yeah, mm -hmm. I, that was a kind of design play. The thing that really made that play was Chooch actually, when he took off, he, he was he was about halfway or a little bit more. And that made the guy that caught the ball really have to make some kind of decision quick. I remember that play because we put it on. I remember that. Yeah. I love that kind of, I love that kind yeah. of forethought and, and, you know, Hey, every run means something in the big leagues. And if you can manufacture right. one like that and uh, you know, you don't see it very often anymore, but certainly a good way, especially right. when you got a guy like Victorino who can fly right. on the base pass uh, down there at third. So um, all right, so you take the lead 2-1. The Diamondbacks, they battle back in the seven, tying the game up on four straight hits off of Kendrick. That would be it for him, but he got you into the seventh. In came R.J. Swindle. He allowed another run. Then Chad Durbin came in, shut it down, and that's where we stood. So in the bottom of the eighth, you guys trailed 5-3. to three, but Once again, rallying late, and this team did it all the time. Howard led off the inning with a walk. Uh, Burl singled to left, and Pedro Feliz would sacrifice them over. Then with one out, Shane Victorino up again, and he triples to tie the game. Um, you know, it, it's it seems like each week when we talk about this team, somebody's doing something late to to help you guys tie or win a ball game. This time it was Shane Victorino. Right. When you look at uh, basically, I, I like to think when you look at the talent on our team and what you know, like uh, we did have a. a, a a team that was hard to go down through our lineup. If you stop and think we had balance and we had a lot of, Hey, and, we, and with Victorino and uh, Utley and, uh, and uh, Jimmy Rollins and worth, we had speed and what we had to do, we had to get a balanced lineup and uh, you know, like, and, 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 and kind of use our talent, just let our talent play in situations. And uh, we had real good success at that, yeah. with that. And, uh, and guys like, uh, the talent Victorino carried in the game is, is tools and stuff like that. You know, like and, and Rollins, them were very similar. So therefore, you know, like we could do some things and, and that's, that just goes to show you that, you know, like when you're, uh, when you're a team and you're playing together and things like that, good things happen for you. I, you know, like I always thought we were that way. Right. Yeah, and no doubt. And, and you know, you just have to go back and look at the results to know that that's exactly the way, you know, it was the way you were built, but it was also the way that you managed the team to allow them to use those skills to, to get uh, the most out of those guys. So uh, that's the way the game would stand. It was tied up at five, and then we would go all the way into the 12th inning. You ended up using six additional pitchers after Kyle Kendrick, and each one of them got the job done and shut everybody down. So in the bottom of the 12th, so Taguchi, he would lead off with a single. Chris Coast sacrificed them over to second. They'd walk Jimmy Rollins, and Jason Worth stepped up and hit a two pitch, uh, two two pitch to the right to right field to help you win the game. I I think I've pretty much mentioned almost everybody on your roster in right. this game. A complete right. team effort to win a game in twelve <laughs> innings. But uh, you know these are big games. They're important games, right. and you're able to get it done. I, you know, like uh, uh, Murph, as you know, we always I always would. Uh, say that hey look every day we, we're going to try to win the game we're going to try to put the best team on the field we possibly can and we're going to try to win the game and you go back and you uh say about us using the pitchers you know like back we were we definitely wanted to win that game and we used that many pitchers because of matchups and things you know like and, and uh, the, the you know, like the best way for us to do things we got we got to match up uh what we wanted on on basically on their hitters 
Mm-hmm. And that right there definitely played a part in this winning game. But then at the end, you know, when we won the game, you know, that there again, it, it, you know, like it tells you what, uh, what kind of team we got and, you know, like things that we had to do. And uh, I remember Jason's worth the, the hit that actually won that game. Mm-hmm. And you know, like, and that was, that was a big hit. And, but not only this, this is a game that was a very important and we definitely wanted to win this game. Of course we want to win all of them, but this is a big game for us. When you're, when you're losing games, when you, when you've been winning great games, you're on a winning streak, of course you want to win all those games, but when you're starting to lose, you've got to do something, you know, like to stay afloat, you know, like and stay close to the race and the, you, you definitely don't want to get far behind and things like that. And if you're in the first place, of course you want to stay there. Yeah, and in a 162-game period, you, there were times when your team wasn't playing well. You lost uh, five in a row, I think, about two weeks prior to this game. So there were times when, you know, and I'm sure Philadelphia was pulling their hair out and saying, oh, my gosh, this team, you know, we got to do something. But uh, at this point of the season, with this win, you guys go up one and a half games in the NL East. You're in first place midway through the season. But? Things would change in the end yeah. of July, and not for a good in a good way. And we're going to talk about that uh, going forward on a future podcast. But as always, Charlie, yeah. always good to see you. Thanks for yeah. helping us relive July 11th, uh, 2008, against the Arizona Diamondbacks. It was a lot of fun. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY. For first bet, risk-free, up to $500. Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, Make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.